Hey everybody, it's Pete Renzulli. Welcome to Stocks for Breakfast. Raise your hand if you're panicking with the market going down right now after that beautiful nine-week rally that we had. All of a sudden, bam, sellers come right in as soon as January 1st comes. A lot of people calling it tax season profit taking. I don't know. All I know is it's going down right now. But more importantly today, right now, we're actually going to talk about some of the deep pullbacks that we've seen. We're going to talk about some stocks that are showing relative strength. Obviously, Apple stock is one of those big stocks that's had a massive move to the downside. It's had some bad news, actually. Boeing, actually, some bad news this morning, uh, actually, over the weekend as well. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to break down how to identify stocks that have the highest likelihood of following through to the upside. Now, there's two different kinds of ideas that we're about to go over. One of them are strong sectors that have pulled back and or at or near support levels that we're looking for. The second one, which is a little bit more interesting, and there's two very specific sectors that we're going to talk about, are those showing relative strength. Now, if you don't understand what relative strength is, or maybe that, that, that language is just a little bit new to you, it's actually pretty simple. If you could visualize the market going down, but a particular group of stocks are kind of going sideways while the market's going down, that's what's known as relative strength. So there's a group of stocks, actually two sectors that we're going to take a look at today, that meet the relative strength criteria. But <laughs> prior to all that, what we're actually going to do is we're going to talk about how to make trading 10 times, 100 times less stressful by knowing what decision you need to make prior to making that decision. Then we're going to break down the concept of order flow stacking, which is the whole context of everything that I do and what I teach our community. But I think then we're going to wrap that up with, OK, we understand relative strength. We understand relative weakness. We understand buying stocks on a dip, when to buy them on a dip, which we're going to get into. We're going to get into the context of order flow stacking and what it actually means and how it makes trading a lot easier. But then we're going to go to the very last step, which is the absolute most important thing for everybody. And I know we're being recorded right now, so I have no problem saying this on video. Risk management needs to be adjusted based on the quality of the idea. And I'm going to show you exactly what I'm looking for in price action and volume, both in the market and in individual stocks to tell me, OK, it's OK now or the situation's a little bit better to start dipping our toes in and what that means for initial risk management. One of the biggest things that we've spent a massive amount of time talking about over the last three months, especially in our private community, um, is all about the quality of the idea and how the quality of the idea forces smart traders to adjust their initial position size up or down based on a bevy of things. And those four things really come down to order flow, how obvious is order flow. Number two, reading the tape is, is order flow still valid right now? And I want to give you a really quick lesson on that. Let's, so let's actually kind of head on to the charts just uh, kind of really quickly here because I want to bring this point home um, and make it something that is actionable. So let's actually go over to something like AMD, for example, right? So obviously AMD has this big, beautiful move to the upside, right? It wouldn't be that hard to say that since the beginning or at the end of October, early November, it's bullish, right? So remember what we're trying to accomplish here. We, we want to get across... Two very important things. Is obvious, is order flow obvious? And number two, is it still valid? So if we take a look at this chart of uh, AMD, can we say, is it obvious? Absolutely, it's obvious. But is it valid right now? And how does that translate into initial position size? So if we kind of move up one level here and we take a look at the weekly chart, the weekly chart is red and negative. So that basically means that red means that from Monday's opening price or in last week's case, Tuesday, when the market opened after the holiday, Tuesday's open price opened here and it's been selling for that entire week. That's one metric. The second metric is the negative net change from the previous Friday. Now you could measure it from the previous Friday's high, the previous Friday's close, whichever one you're more comfortable with. But it's two metrics telling us that the current order flow, as measured for swing traders based on the weekly candle, is not valid in the context of that longer term big move to the upside. So the first two questions, is it obvious? Yes. Number two, 
Is it still valid? No. As of right now, the current order flow in those stocks and in the majority of stocks that you know we determine the best stocks to buy now on that dip, as of right now, they're selling. So if a long-term picture or stacked order flow, as we call it, is bullish, but short-term order flow is bearish, that changes our risk management, which risk management and trade management, they kind of get mixed up sometimes. Risk management is what we're putting into the idea. The risk on the actual trade, how we're managing it is a little bit different. But we always need to first start out with risk management and the quality of the idea and what that implies for putting money into the deal. So if we go back to, and I say deal, I mean the next trade. If we go back to that weekly chart of AMD and we take a look at this week and 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 this, right? All of these weeks were the entire week pretty much it was going up. So that meant the current order flow was in sync with the stacked order flow. Now, I want to be clear about this. You could be trading on a weekly basis for swing trades. You could be trading on an hourly basis for day trades. It doesn't make a difference. You could be looking at the daily opening price and holding it till four o'clock in the afternoon. That could be the window of time that you're managing your trades, right? But what matters is that it's consistent. That's what really matters. So you need some way of saying order flow is stacked, but is it going in that direction right now? So if we go back to these weekly candles, you would, we would, I would trade position size differently if the window that I'm looking at, and the window in this case is weekly swing trades, is validating the bigger picture. As of right now, that is not the case. And that's the biggest thing I want to give everybody heading into this week. It really, really makes a difference because the uh, quality of the idea – which really is how many reasons can I put into that trade matter? Because if you're just simply saying it was higher than Friday or higher than yesterday, that's one data point. That's not enough. And if raise your hand if you get shaken out of good ideas. That's why. That's one of the reasons why. The other two points I want to get across are the optimal entry and finishing up with the profit maximizer. So if the first two are, is it obvious and is it still valid? And let's say we get a yes or no answer to that and that gives us initial position size, then we need to go to the back half of the idea, which is, is it the right time to buy? And then how do I hold a good trade longer? And even more importantly, do I have a plan to add or build into that position to tell me now the trade is still valid? So you see, these aren't really that difficult of decisions. What you really need to have is a list like I just gave you. So I wanna kind of bring this all down uh, into a structure so it's easy to follow. Look, I've, there's a billion things that you could read about, but the bottom line is how do you make a decision that is consistent and makes your positive results repeatable? That's really what we're looking for. So I want I'm actually kind of excited because I want to break that down for you uh, here this morning as well. Uh, I just want to say good morning to a couple of people. Uh, hey, Joe, thanks so much for being here today. Gavin, always a pleasure. Nice to see you. And my buddy Al. Al and I had a big hug when we met in October. That was awesome. Um, okay, so what I want to do now is I want to, actually first let me post this up here. Just uh, make sure I put that in there. Um, obviously, everything we talk about here is for information purposes. It's up to you to make uh, a better decision, and hopefully, I'm helping you do that. Right. Um, so I, again, I'm very excited. Let, let's actually hop into this because uh, it kind of matters. So I'm actually going to drop myself over here, and I want to walk through. Right. So you can see how I'm actually mapping this out. Right. All right let me zoom that back a little bit. The masses have begun to panic, right? So we actually see this little bit of a pullback. And a lot of people, every headline you read, and we talked about uh, CNBC last week, uh, analysts who had these monster calls for 2024 after two days of panicking. Absolutely, positively ridiculous. How do you call yourself an analyst predicting 2024 and two days into the year you're panicking? I'll tell you how. You don't have structure. You don't understand that if this happens, then I plan to do this. And there's not enough data after two days. So let's continue. I get, I'm getting loud because I'm getting excited, right? And that's why the masses lose, all right? They don't have a plan, not a plan at all, even a bad one. Most people want stocks to simply go up, keep going so they don't need to make a decision. Those nine weeks of straight up, that was awesome, right? Boom, 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 boom. Couldn't mess it up. Now, here's the thing. If you raised your hand at the beginning of today's call, uh, today's video, uh, and you said, wow, the stock market is going down now, this stinks, blah, 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 blah. And you kind of hit all that stuff into the equation. You have to dial it back 
and simply say that is what's happening. What should I do? Now, that what should I do part is the part that we all need to have planned out before we need to make that decision. I want you to write this down, and I'm going to give you some criteria right now, which I think is very important. Plus, I'm going to give you the exact criteria that I'm looking for to determine we've stopped going down in a big way, and then what that means to increase initial position size. So here's the part that I want to get across really clearly. Until I see what I'm about to show you, which is known as an accumulation day, until I see that, I am still planning to buy stocks on the dip, but I have lowered my initial position size until I see something very specific. I want you to be very clear on that. Every trade is unique, which means that every trade calls for different risk management. That's very, very important. It's just silly to think that every single trade calls for the same risk, the same capital allocation, because every trade is unique. And again, I'm going to keep bringing it back to the part that I think is the most um, obvious and easy to understand analogy, which is driving. I grew up on Long Island, Long Island Expressway 495, right? There's no way in the world I would get on the Long Island Expressway every single day and just decide to drive 75. It's silly, <laughs> including what time of day you would do it and when you would do it and the conditions you would do it, right? But for some reason, we're just not taught enough in the markets that the more distinctions we could make, on the quality of that idea that we're considering is going to dictate how much we should put in to start the trade. Some trades are awesome. Step on the gas. It's great. Nobody's on the road with you. And then there's other times it's raining, it's snowing, there's black ice, there's a car accident, it's rush hour. All of those other reasons will have you pull back on the gas because that's the right thing to do in that moment. And then when you get more positive feedback from the market, you start to add to that position. That's the key to trading. Stop predicting, stop forecasting. You don't need to buy stocks because you believe you know where they're going to be in a month from now. Our job is to simply say, here's what's going on right now, and how do I know if it's still valid? That's the part that I want to get across to you right now. And you're going to want to screenshot this part because it's a pretty cool lesson. All right? All right. If you don't have a plan, then it's easy to put the blame on the market or some unknown force that causes you to lose money. You're safe. With this strategy, it's not your fault. It's not where you want to be. And that's exactly why most people don't have conviction to make consistent money. They don't want to be held responsible for when things go wrong or when price action reverses. But that's also why your results are hit and miss. You're also not the reason you make money. You simply got lucky. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be good than lucky. There's two primary questions everyone must answer. This is the part here that I want you to take a screenshot of because it's very important to keep your trading as simplistic but repeatable as possible. Is it obvious? Now, I want to take this into a, a second level before I get to is it valid because we kind of just went around this. Is it obvious for the time frame you are trading? Now, clearly, there's a bunch of different questions you can get into on what time frame you're trading. Generally speaking, it gets answered in two different ways. And this is really important. When I had my, my uh, trading firm in New York City, we would have a really good discussion around each individual's risk tolerance and how many resources they were bringing into the business. Resources such as experience, um, how, how good they were actually placing orders, understanding all the kinds of orders and whatnot. And then we would kind of reverse engineer what profits they were going after based on the kind of risk they were comfortable with. So some people like risk between the open and close during the day. Some people like swing trades. That dictates which order flow you're watching. So if we say, is order flow obvious? It could be on an hourly chart. It could be on a five-minute chart. If that happens to be the kind of risk you're okay with, it could be on a monthly chart. If you're not looking to look at prices and you just want to get in on one earnings report and the other. And by the way, we're going to talk about earnings reports today as well. So it's very, very important that you answer the question, is it obvious? But prior to that, you need to know which time frame you are actually trading, which time frame you plan to hold the stock you bought. One of the biggest surprising questions that we get for new members into our community is, is the trend still valid or is this stock still valid? And it's shocking to me because that really implies when somebody comes into the community that they don't know which trend, which order flow they're trading. <laughs> So you can understand how people get caught in a panic when things reverse because they're not sure 
which order flow they're trading, they simply know it went up yesterday. And that's a bad spot to be in because you can't tell if it's valid and you can't tell if it changes. That's the key that I want everybody to get across. And I kind of showed you at the beginning of the call where we talked about longer term move to the upside. And as a swing trader, last week was red. So I could still look for a spot to buy if I got signals on the daily chart, even if the weekly chart was red, because that longer term picture is still obvious. But I have reduced my initial position size because the current order flow is not in sync with the obvious longer term order flow. And we can talk about this on a day trade as well. I'll, I'll give you an example for those of you that happen to be day trading. We could be looking at a daily chart and saying, okay, that's great. It's going up right now. That's awesome, right? We call this well bid, higher highs, higher lows, close positive. Then if that's in sync and you're day trading, you could then go down to shorter time frames and say, is right now in sync with how I'm measuring order flow, how I'm measuring that trend. Very, very important to understand. Trend comes first. Order flow comes first. How long has that order flow been stacked? Only then do you start to look for opportunity. Okay. So let's continue to run through this. I really want you to take a screenshot of this. Okay. Number one is, is it obvious, which is what we just talked about. What kind of risk are you comfortable with? That's going to dictate the order flow that you're watching to determine if it's obvious. Then is it valid? So is it valid is what I just determined, right? Whether you're day trade, swing trade, earnings trade, investing, you still need to know, is it obvious and is it still valid? And I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't know or don't have a measurement for determining it's potentially changing or has changed, and I'll give you an example, um, Roku, probably one of the best examples uh, that we've been watching recently. Um, you can kind of see how we perfectly mapped this out where a beautiful move to the upside, the bigger picture, started to become less obvious. And then we had a confirmed change of trend to the downside. When you have a structure, it's relatively easy to answer those two questions. Is it obvious? Is it still valid? And then the next part is, how do I know if it's changed? And I maybe even consider trading in the other direction. So I want to keep going through this because I really want you to have this to take a scrap shot, a scrap, a screenshot of. Most people are okay with the first question, which is, is it obvious? Very few people can handle the second one because it requires them to make a decision. And that means they are in charge of the result. And I'm going to highlight that because that's a really scary moment for people because now it's not the market's fault. It's not somebody's fault that they watched on television or watched on YouTube. It's not the algorithm's fault anymore. It's your responsibility. All right. And that scares the heck out of most people. As Warren Buffett says, only when the tide goes out, do you learn who has been swimming naked. So why did I put that quote in there? It actually comes down to what's going on in the market right now. So how many people were a genius during this move to the upside and saying, it's me, 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 me. I'm the reason the mar I'm the reason I'm making money. It's me, 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 me. Meanwhile, it was just the market with vicious moves to the upside. You had to work hard to actually mess it up, right? But now when the market turns around, they're looking for reasons or they're looking for someone to blame or they're saying, why, 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 why? Instead of, I got this. Hold my beer. I know what I'm doing. It doesn't matter if it's going up or down. I'm in charge. That is the place that you want to get to when you're in the stock market. When you determine which ones are the best stocks to buy and you get in and you understand what is the right initial risk for the quality of that idea, you are 100% in control of the results. And there is no more amazing place to be because then you'll start to wake up every day expecting to make money, not because you will, there's definitely losing days, but you will expect to because you know what you're doing and you know what you're looking for and you have a plan no matter what happens. So if you are panicking during this move to the downside, you're not trading with a plan. Those with the plan say, if this happens, then I plan to do this. If it's going up and going up and going up, great. I have a system in place. Our system is called the Profit Maximizer to hold those trades. If we reverse, we also have a system. If this happens and this happens, then I do this. It's simply reading the market and taking action. It's not predicting. It's not guessing. It's not forecasting. And that's why most people struggle. Where do you think this is going to be a month from now? 
Nobody knows. And if you doubt that for one second, go to your favorite news channel, read all the headlines and predictions they made November, December, and January, and see how many are off the chart, not, not even close to unfolding. That's okay. Everybody can have their own opinion, their own way of looking at things, but you need to come up with one that makes sense for you. And obviously the way we do things with order flow stacking makes sense to a lot of people because we've got some just amazing people in our community and hopefully you're learning this from me now. But I want to take that into actually what order flow stacking is, what I'm looking for in the market as far as an accumulation day and how that will reflect when I would increase my position size. And then I'm going to work my way over into some ideas, including Apple and what I'd be looking for on those ideas. Okay. All right. You can tell I'm very excited about this topic to start the week, right? All right. So now what? Right now what? Well, if you're in our community, you have a system, a method, if you will, that tells if this happens, then we do this. Things reversed. Okay. When you have reference points, actually spelled that wrong, reference points for price action to answer number two, trading becomes infinitely easier. So trading question number two is, is it still valid, right? So we're answering number two, stop guessing. No one knows what's going to happen next. Reads what's unfolding. Don't predict. It's a hundred times easier and less stressful. So here's my goal for you as a trader. I can't, not financial goal. This is more professional goal. This is more, I know what I'm doing. Just map out what kind of risk are you willing to take? Do you not want to carry overnight risk? Do you not like to trade intraday? You think it's all noise? Doesn't matter. It's not right or wrong. It's got to match your personality. So which order flow are you watching? How are you determining Buyers or sellers are definitely in charge. How do you recognize that in price action or earnings or however you do it, right? Then ask yourself, what do I do if it keeps going? How do I know when it's potentially changing? And how do I know when it's validated changing? All of those have nothing to do with predicting. If you are forecasting, predicting, or wondering where it's going to be in a month from now, or even worse, saying, I think this particular trade might not work, then you don't have a system, a process that says, yes, everything I'm looking for is there right now, and that means I'm good to go. Or everything I'm looking for, hmm, maybe one thing out of seven is there. Ah, I could justify the trade, but I reduce it. You are in charge when you have that kind of criteria. So now we're going to break that down a little bit more for you as well. Okay. All right. So what exactly is order flow stacking, right? Most of the stuff on CNBC is this stock went up, that stock went up because of this reason and because of that reason, right? Everybody reads all that kind of stuff. Everybody understands what's going on, right? But very few people understand how to make money. That's a key. And I've said this a hundred times before. If you haven't heard me say it before, chart reading is not trading. Trading is the skill of making money. Chart reading is looking for patterns. That's not the same thing. There's no emotion to say uh, there's a pennant, there's a bull flag, there's a stochastic crossover, there's a golden cross, whatever. That's not trading. That's chart reading. Trading is the skill of making money. So just ask yourself right now, are you seeing consistent results? That means that you now know you need to work on the second part, which is the skill of trading. All right. All right. Because they try to predict where the stock is going. Knowing Kathy Ward or Bill Ackman is buying is nice, but how do we know when they are adding more, which is also known as accumulating or building a position, how do we know when they stop? Think about that. How do we know when they add? How do we know when they stop? That's order flow stacking. So the structure of order flow stacking and the second part, the profit maximizer, is what makes money, making money repeatable, almost predictable, all right? We've had a lot of people in our community tell us you put the pieces together. That's kind of what I'm, I'm doing for you right now, hopefully, right? Order flow stacking is a unique way of organizing stock prices and volume, which is the amount of money allocated that tells us which stocks, how long are they adding, spotting potential changes, and then when to exit. So order flow stacking is the slow accumulation or distribution of money from institutions. It's one thing to say, yeah, I saw that on CNBC. Everybody knows that. Yeah, well, does everybody make money? No. No. What we want to do is we want to learn to read the price action, learn to read the volume so that you can wake up every day and say, no matter what happens, 
I know what I'm doing. That's a golden place to be and a, a place of serenity, quite honestly. It's like being on a fly in the wall. We read what they're doing. We don't predict what they will do next. That's why what we do is shadowing the institutions. We're not predicting or scared if they change their mind. Think about this. And I just want to really head home with this for, for a lot of people. Think about how many times were you afraid to place a trade? Now, when you're afraid to place a trade, that means, number one, you might not know what's obvious because you really haven't thought it through. But really down deep, a lot of people who are afraid to place a trade, you'll hesitate, you'll be scared, is because you're not sure if that particular trade is going to work out. You're predicting. That's what you're doing. You're saying, will this one work out? If you did the work prior to the trade and learned how to do order flow stacking, it doesn't matter. Because all you're doing is saying, right now it's valid. Right now it's obvious and right now it's valid. We can't do anything about what happens after that as far as pushing that stock around. But we have every say about what we do if it remains valid or if it changes. Think about that. You are reading the price action and volume, not predicting where it's going to go. And that is infinitely easier to be involved in stocks and buy stocks and understand when to sell stock and understand how much to put into it. And we're going to get up to that right now. OK. All right. So this is the part that we want to get to. All right. We read the price action around distinct reference points. We program the software to tell us which stocks meet most of that criteria. This means we're always on the right side of the order flow, both long term and short term. The actual key is knowing the depth money allocated by institutions and when it stops. So before I move on, there's a lot to cover here today. because I can see I'm all jazzed up about this. I want to challenge you like we have these calls, you know, these stocks for breakfast calls every Monday. I want to challenge you between now and next Monday. Just give yourself a seven day window. Really think about what you're looking at in the market. What definitely does not work. Stop doing that. Write it out. You got to write it out. Don't put it in here. You got to write it out. Picking tops doesn't work. Picking bottoms doesn't work. Same share size. Every trade doesn't work. All those kinds of things. Right. Then structure and say, when this happens, then I plan to do this both in my favor and against me. I know that sounds simplistic and everybody knows about a trading plan. Yeah. But do you actually have one? Do you actually take the time to say, no matter what happens, I understand what I'm going to do. Most people don't, which is why most people have a yo-yo like this in their P&L. Well, they make $3,000, give back $2,900. Make $4,000, give back $3,800. And they end up in the same place a year from now. Take the time over the next seven days. It's not a long period of time. Say, what do I actually do? What kind of risk do I like? What kind of profits am I comfortable with for that risk? And then how do I identify when it's obvious? How do I identify when it changes. That's the key. Stop trying to predict. All right. Now we're going to get into a little bit more detail. Okay. All right. So how does this all tie into risk management? Right. I mentioned this pretty much every day for the last three weeks, but it's worth bringing up again. I'm starting my swing trades with lower initial position size until I see the market catch a bid. Now catch a bid is kind of like a professional trading term it means that buyers have stepped up. At the very least, I'd like to see the spy close as a well bid candle, which means higher highs, higher lows, near the high of the day, positive by 1% and on above average volume. Take a screenshot of that. That's four different criteria I'm looking for before I decide to get bigger on my positions during this pullback. Yes, it requires that much definitive answers. Think about this. We're going up and down with our position size based on the quality of the idea. Right now, the market's pulling back. The biggest question right now is, is it time to buy the dip? Should I buy Apple on this big pullback? Should I buy the semiconductor stocks on this big pullback? Are those the best stocks to buy now? Well, they could be because Apple was just at all-time highs two weeks ago. Take all the news out recently, right? AMD, all the semiconductor stocks have been the talk of the last 12 months, right? That hasn't changed. But what we're looking for is the right time to step in and say the road opens up and now we can push the gas. That's the criteria I just gave you. Now what we're going to break down are some of the ideas that have relative strength or are stocks that I'm looking to buy on the pullback. But first, let's actually get into Apple a little bit here because that was kind of the, um, 
visual of what we're looking at. By the way, I just want to make sure everybody's aware of the earnings that are coming out this week. Very, very important. We're about to talk about some of the financial stocks. The question at this particular moment is, should we be looking at initiating new swing trades in some of these financial stocks that are reporting earnings or scheduled to report earnings at the end of the week? Do we want to chase stocks like JP Morgan at all time highs while earnings are coming out in just four days? Well, now we go back a step and we say, well, what do we need to see to tell us that the change might be coming? Something might be changing. Well, we go to volume. We take a look at volume and we drop down and be like, is volume doing, quote unquote, what we want to? Well, the stock has kind of gone higher, but we had a failed test of a breakout, a failed test of a breakout and increased volume on a failed test. So let's just keep things common sense. We broke out on heavy volume and failed. Broke out on heavy volume to all time highs and failed. Earnings are in five days. They're coming out on Friday. What would I say about whether or not order flow is still valid? Well, it's still definitely pushing to the upside. It's still obvious. Is it still valid? Yes. But are we in a situation where we are pausing on light volume, which implies follow through? There's two kinds of pauses, heavy volume and light volume. Light volume, you see push up and a pause. And during that pause is light volume. That's good. Nothing changed. When we push up and pause on heavy volume, something is changing. That's what I'm noticing right now in JP Morgan and some of these financial stocks. They're on my radar, but I am waiting for them to pull back to reset an optimal entry. And I want that pullback to be on lighter volume. I don't like heavy volume pauses that fail, especially at all time highs. If you watched our video a couple of weeks ago, click on the link where it happens to be. We literally said in the video that smart money was selling on the way up. And this is the visual of what we're talking about. And that's the selling that we got into the first week of the market. So that wasn't a guess. That was just putting these pieces together. OK, so let's continue to work our way through some of the ideas and how we're looking at them. OK, so sector rotation is a big part of what I'm looking at this week. Financials and healthcare moved up the chain. So what I mean by that is the research that I do for the community um, at the end of every day. We're actually working our way into uh, stacked order flow and how many stocks meet that criteria. And right now you can see healthcare and financial are at the top of the list. So within that context of healthcare and financial, those are obviously going to be the first stocks I'm looking at because they have the most stocks and the biggest percentage gains in the time frame that I read stacked order flow. So you got to start there. Is the market obvious? Yes or no. Which sectors are obvious? Yes or no. Which stocks are showing relative strength? Yes or no. Right. So before we get into that, I just want to make sure that we do a deep dive into Apple. Obviously, we want to keep an eye on Apple pulling back on these bearish gaps with the news. We need to now say what would be the right time to be bidding into Apple if we still like the stock. Well, the deepest pullback that I personally will allow is a 50 period moving average. And we've actually blasted through that as well. So as far as buying Apple on this dip, I'm not into it right now. I know that it's, it's a great company and all those kinds of things, but it doesn't meet at least the minimum criteria for me to dive in there and say I'm looking to do that. And you can actually see in the bottom right hand corner, Apple pulling back on some really heavy volume and continuing to go down. What we would need to see is this criteria again right here. Now, I wrote this down for the market, but we want to see this in Apple as well. We want to see Apple trade with higher highs, higher lows, close near the high of the day, close by 1% and do it on above average volume. Now, if we kind of take that into context as well, it's still below that criteria. Even if that happens today, it still doesn't meet my minimum criteria if you want to be involved in the stock. So if that's one criteria where it positively turns around on heavy volume, that would be significantly lower volume. The next, uh, excuse me, significantly less position size for me. The next place I would consider buying, and remember, this is all mapped out, right? I'm telling you what I plan to do even before I'm looking to get into the trade is if we know that this is the minimum viable criteria in Apple and we get that reversal on heavy volume, closing near the highs, higher highs, higher lows, I wouldn't even be considering adding until we closed above here on a light volume pause. So that's how I have the next two moves in Apple mapped out before it even happens. That's a position of strength. And that's what I would hopefully inspire you to think through the same way that you know what you plan to do, need to do before you do it, because you know what you need to see before it happens. That's not predicting. That's planning. That's preparation, which is different. There's a quote that I just absolutely love 
which is I'd rather be prepared for an opportunity that never comes than not prepared when one does. I have no idea who said that. If you know, leave a comment in the quotes, but it's absolutely awesome. I want to be prepared no matter what. That's essentially what it means. So while Apple's got this big, deep pullback, it's still on my radar. Obviously, it's involved in pretty much dozens of ETFs at this point. I want to know when that thing reverses, because not only will Apple carry a lot of stocks in the market and especially the tech sector, but I can make some money in that individual stock if it meets that criteria. So there's so many different influences there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to break down a little bit of sector rotation, and you can take snapshots of these because these are the ideas that I'm looking at during the week. All right. Now, again, it's a lot of stuff, right? But this is what it takes. If you want me to do this for you and you're curious, there's actually a video, right? It's a 50-minute video where I explain all this in a lot of detail. You can actually click that link below the video, sign up, watch that video, and then you get a much better idea of what order flow stacking actually means. Okay, you can actually get that link in the description. All right, so working our way through here um, into the sector rotation. So financials and healthcare, I just showed you, moved up the list. Technology found a bottom with semiconductor stocks like AMD going well bid. So well bid basically means higher highs and higher lows. But heavier volume on well bid is good, but it closed well off the highs. So it's nice, but it's indecision. Any candle with a small body is indecision. If it traded up, traded down, and closed and opened in almost the same spot, that's indecision. So step one is well bid, fantastic, heavy volume. Okay, cool. Did it close near the high? No. How cool is that? So just in this one video right now, we just learned about well bid and how volume plays into that and how where it closes on the day also matters. We tied that back into JP Morgan, new high, heavy volume failed, new high, heavy volume failed. That's not what we want to see. So if we have that roadmap we put over the market and say, here's what perfect looks like. Anything that's not perfect moves us away from maximum position size. So you see how we're kind of tying in risk management, trade management, quality of the idea. We're in charge. That's what we want. So if you have a couple of losing trades on ideas that are less than perfect, they don't hurt because you size down. This is the part that most people never understand. It's our job, it's our responsibility. Quite frankly, it's our right <laughs> to adjust position size up or down based on the quality of the idea and based on the follow through. If we get the follow through that we want, then we have a choice to add into that position because it's doing exactly what we want. Do you start to see how trading can actually be fun? It's more like playing chess where you're like, if this happens, then I plan to do this or I plan to do that. But that's all in your control. If you feel like the market's overwhelming or confusing or you're just not sure what to do next, you just need to think one step further. It's not that hard. You just need the questions. And that's really, again, I say it over and over again. That's where trading is fun and it's the most beautiful business in the world to run because you wake up every day saying, it doesn't matter what happens. I know what I plan to do. And that is the best situation. So now we're going to take, we're going to go a little bit deeper into sector rotation. So you see some of the reasons of what I'm looking for. So AMD indecision, that would lower my initial position size. But healthcare, healthcare shows 21 stocks with stacked order flow, a solid number with depth of conviction, right? So you can start to see that while the market's going down, a lot of these ideas have relative strength. Now, relative strength and room to go slash profit potential is the next step. Once we identify it's obvious and still valid, then we got to take the next step and look for the optimal entry. All right. Fresh news about a new virus, right? Obviously has Moderna in a pretty big spot right now. Came out of the year, exploding to the upside. It's got some selling action here that we have to get through, but the next level through that is 160. So 125 to 160 is a better trade, maybe looking for a smaller position between those two levels. So we're noticing his relative strength now, right? Other stocks to have in the watch list in healthcare is this list here, including Amgen and AbbVie. Johnson & Johnson is one that we opened a new swing trade in last week. Banks and insurance stocks prepped, uh, excuse me, propped up financials last several weeks. Don't ignore the boring stocks, especially insurance stocks. I'm going to show you a couple of charts here now as well. Uh, and again, as I said, be, be aware that financial stocks have earnings, the scheduled earnings coming out on Friday. You can see that Citigroup popped through the short-term resistance and has plenty of room to go. When's the last time we talked about Citigroup, right? You can see the order flow. You can see it's stacked. You can see it fought through some resistance levels, minor resistance here with plenty of room to go. This is what we want. 
Stacked order flow, obvious, still valid with room to go, right? Moving along, JP Morgan, we just talked about it. I like JP Morgan, but it's got earnings coming out, heavy volume and indecision. I'm leaving it alone. See how I'm planning it? I'm not even doing anything. I'm planning on what I'm doing later in the week. No guessing. PNC and USB, other banks to keep an eye on, as well as WAL and ZION, Zion, right? PNC Financial, we have an alert over 160, and you can see why. I'm not going to do anything until it gets up to that level that has some more room to go through that level. See how I'm mapping it out, setting alerts, setting buy stops, knowing the levels that I wanted to hit? Nothing until that happens. Insurance stocks. Look at travelers lining up here a couple of days, three days pausing. Allstate, uh, CB, Affleck, all of them are hanging in there pretty good right now. PFG, big energy candlestick. Again, getting back to what I said before, well bid, above average candle. We call this one a fuel candlestick. A fuel candlestick is a stock that is in a trading range, breaks out of that trading range on heavy volume, and closes near the high. It's fuel. We kind of labeled it fuel because fuel starts a move, exhaustion ends a move. The same candle, heavy volume, big green, where it happens matters. Heavy volume, big green, breaking out of a trading range is fuel. Heavy volume, big green, after several weeks of buying is exhaustion. One starts a move, one ends a move. Where that price action happens matters in the decisions that we make. Okay. So I just want to tie things up here because we talked about a bunch of other ideas. Asset management companies, APO and KKR. You can actually see that APO had relative strength last week. So remember, we talked about that relative strength, holding the bid, rallied while the market was going down, and it actually paused. Now, we got two different kinds of price discovery up here where APO got up to that level and failed. So you got two different decisions. We're looking at where it went up to and could not get through, which is technically this area over here around 96. And you have this pause after the bullish gap on Friday. So we have constructive price action, but I would be looking to get involved above 96 because that's really the level where it failed a couple of times. So 96-ish, maybe 96.50. So you see where I'm looking? That's the level I'm looking at, all right? Moving along with some other ideas on the screen, credit services stocks. Sit near optimal entries. Now, that's a very big part of the question right there. Sit near optimal entries means that JP Morgan was too far. These stocks are at or near an optimal entry where I would consider them for new ideas today heading into this week. Optimal entry means there's still good reward potential based on what the stock normally does. So AXP, COF, and Ally Bank all meet that criteria for me right now. Now, Ally, A-L-L-Y, is a bullish engulfing candlestick. Engulfing candlestick means it took out the low and in this case took out the high and closed strong. So one side of the market is actually caught on the wrong side. Those who sold short on that breakdown only to see that thing reverse higher in the other direction are screwed, basically. And these patterns typically follow through. So we had a heavy volume bullish engulfing candlestick to the upside. I'm actually going to show you something similar that happened in the other direction that followed through, which was Roku. Roku actually took out this high and then immediately reversed and took out the low in the next candle. And that's why we actually called Roku as an early stage bearish move, very similar to Chevron, which we have as an early stage bullish move at this point once it broke out and kind of went sideways. So there's a lot of stuff to unpack this week. So heading into this week, I already told you what I'm looking for, both in the bigger picture in the market. And which is heavy volume reversal with all that criteria. If you want, you can go back and snapshot that picture. Uh, and then I also talked about which sectors are showing relative strength when the market's going down. So they're holding up while the market's going down, if not even breaking out, which right now, healthcare and financial stocks meet that criteria. We also talked about semiconductor stocks and kind of on the side also talked about Apple, which the big picture, that big blue perfect line to the upside looks great. But recently, the order flow is not valid for a swing trade. So we're looking for those stocks and those pullbacks to also give us those heavy volume reversals that close near the high. If we get that and they're above certain key levels, we can get in there with a little bit more initial position size. But as we talked about with Apple, which pulled back dramatically, that would be a lower initial position size looking for feedback as it moves in our favor. It's kind of fun, like you're putting the pieces together, like this means that much, this means that, that means this. 
it's not hard. It's just a couple of things you need to look at. You just need repetition. You just need to say, okay, I know what I'm looking for. Is it there? I know what I'm looking for. Is it there? Now, that's one piece of it. But actually acting on it is what will level you up in a way where you just wake up every day and say, you know what? I don't care what's on CNBC. I don't care what I watched wherever or what podcast I listen to. It's great. I'll use it for information. I will use it as entertainment. I'll use it to get some ideas. But ultimately, I'm going to rely on myself because I have structure. I know how I want to risk money. I know what kind of profits I'm going after. And then more importantly, I understand which order flow tells me that what I'm looking for is valid and obvious or whether I should do nothing, have another cup of coffee and wait for it to line up in a way that makes sense to me. That's the ultimate control in the stock market, choosing how you play. All right. Awesome start to the week, everybody. Let's call it a meeting. Let's head on out and make our game plans for this week. Let's make it an awesome, awesome week. Again, watch this video more than once. If, you, if there's some stuff in there that you want to make sure you take a screenshot on, follow up, leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. If we did a good job today, do me a favor, give us a thumbs up. And if you want to watch that order flow video, click that link in the description. It's roughly 50 minutes and it walks you through from start to finish in a little more detail everything we're talking about here today. All right. Have an awesome day, everybody. I'll speak to you soon. Thanks so much for joining me.